Hey everybody, I don't know about you, but as you've watched out over the world, the war in uh, Russia and Ukraine is not just isolated to Eastern Europe. It's spread all over the world and you can see it in market instabilities. You can see it here. People who do not think that that war is affecting you, all you got to do is look at gas prices. You look at uh, your food prices. You see the, the global uh, change that has happened. But you know something that's also affected investments as well. And I've said all along, Legacy Precious Metals is your navigator. They're the ones that see you through to get to the next level. The good news about this is even with market volatility, market instability, you've got uh, options. And gold prices are rising as investors turn to gold. And gold presents a hedge against this inflation and that protects you uh, against the weakening dollar, which we are seeing. Legacy Precious Metals is the only company I trust to deal with gold and silver and the other precious metals. You need this investment. You need this as part of your portfolio to keep you buffered from what we're seeing in the world. War and, and, and volatility in the market. This is where you need to be. Uh, call Legacy Precious Metals today. Uh, be proactive about this. Get on board with it. Call them at 866-528-1900. 0386-528-1903, or you can download their free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com. LegacyPMInvestments.com, your navigator in a volatile world of investments. Do you want to listen to a podcast? By who? Georgia GOP Congressman Doug Collins. How, how is it? The greatest thing I have ever heard in my whole life. I could not believe my ears. In this house, wherever the rules are disregarded, chaos and mob rule. It has been said today, where is bravery? I'll tell you where bravery is found and courage is found. It's found in this minority who has lived through the last year of nothing but rules being broken, people being put down, questions not being answered, and this majority say, be damned with anything else. We're going to impeach and do whatever we want to do. Why? Because we won an election. I guarantee you, one day you'll be back in the minority and it ain't going to be that fun. Hey everybody, it's Doug Collins. Welcome back to the podcast. Glad to have you uh, joining along with us today. I, I want to hit into something today, and we're, it's, it's, as we talk about politics, as we talk about uh, the events that are going on, one of the things I am often asked about is how do you handle talking to the media? How do you handle messaging? How do you do uh, you know? How do you deal with things that come up in a, either a campaign or in your if you're an elected official in your elected office? How is the best way? Uh, to handle these things. I'm often asked this by candidates. I'm often asked this by people who've never been in office because, you know, it, it's something that we don't think about. It, it's something that happens typically after the fact. If you're in a campaign and there's not a lot of press and not a lot of media attention, then for the most part, you don't have to deal with these things unless something messes up in your campaign, unless something, you know, uh, goes wrong and then all of a sudden you have media attention. For people who are running for the Senate, for people who are running for Congress, for people who are in the United States House, for those who run for president, of course, and those who become president, uh, this is an everyday uh, lifestyle. You have to understand what you say, how you say it is all going to make a difference. And and today on the podcast, you know, one of the things I want to point out, and, and look, you see this on both sides of the aisle, but what is amazing to me is when it happens at the highest levels, and that is why tell a, a lie when the truth will do just as good. Why do you, uh, why can you not just be honest when a situation happens instead of either deflecting, making like it never happened and doubling down? Now we've seen this with the Republicans. We've seen it with the Democrats. I'm going to focus today. And, and bef you know, if any of you want to, you know, chime in, you go to the Doug Collins podcast.com. You send me an email. I, I get those. Um, but I, I want you to understand this is at the highest level. Uh, right now, we're going through the government. And, and the reason I'm approaching it from this perspective is, is there are a lot of Democrats, and I heard a Democrat ask the question the other day is, why are people not receptive to Joe Biden? You know, why Why is it? And, and again, from my perspective, I could start listing off a long list of policies and things that are said and things that are done. And, and, and all of those would be true. The, the interesting part about this is, though, is I think it goes back to a deeper sub-level. Uh, and really some of this came out in the Georgia Senate race that we're dealing with down here and the issues of truthfulness on, Walk on a Herschel Walker standpoint, the truthfulness on a Raphael Warnock standpoint, and how the uh, camps are handling uh, different issues. But when I come back to the, this basic and I think about this for a while, this is a, a sort of a, not only just a political lesson, but a life lesson uh, that I think we deal with is that, you know, there is such a thing as too much information. 
Okay, let's just start off here in, in this uh, this discussion. Uh, I have seen too many candidates who just get up and and say, you know, they they get the runs in the mouth and and they ask a question. And they share far more information than they ever should have about an issue or trying to explain if they end up getting themselves in circles that that is in one case a, a very much of a problem there is such a thing as too much information sometimes if you're a, asked do you know what time it is you simply need to say yes or no not explain what time it is and how the watch works we see this happen a, a great deal with uh, individuals in uh, in public office we see it with press and comms people as well this is uh, again we're going to talk about that in a minute as well but the other aspect of this is, again, not addressing things, just basically ignoring them. That's the other extreme, if you would, is just saying, I'm not going to answer the question, moving on, being rude or, or, or being abrupt with press and just saying, hey, it'll go it'll go away. There is a, a train of thought in political uh, world that says that if I just simply ignore it, uh, it'll go away. Well, some cases that is true. I will say uh, today in our heavily partisan environment, especially in some of uh, the races that we're seeing across the country, this could be true. Now, I'm not going to get into breakdowns of different races. We're going to do that on another podcast shortly. But today, as we go at it, I want to take what we're seeing, translate it into the president of the United States, because Democrats uh, behind the scenes are legitimately frustrated. They're legitimately upset because they have a president in which they've had the president, the House, the Senate for over almost 20 months now. And some of the things that they wanted to get done, they have passed on a very partisan basis. And a lot of it from a conservative standpoint has backfired, has not worked as it should. But for liberals, they're sitting here saying, this: why isn't this working? Why is the Biden administration not out you know, promoting this? Why are, are we seeing Biden's poll numbers so bad? And, and then some will start blaming the Republicans. Some of you know, of course, they'll blame Donald Trump. They'll, they'll blame the media. They'll blame everybody else. But inherently, I think the Democrats have gotten into a situation in which the story they believe, because they've had such willing accomplices many times in the media, not every time, but most of the time, that they believe they could simply say whatever they wanted to say and get away with it, and, and or, or at least not be followed up on. Or if it is followed up on, it's on page 12, not page one. And so this morning, I, I want to, and it's not just President Biden. I mean, down here in Georgia, in, in the Georgia governor's race, Stacey Abrams, who uh, I listened to an interview recently that she did on uh, NPR, in which she made some pretty, you know, one very enlightening statement. She said that it's something that I've been saying about her for now for a while is that she's not the 2018 Stacey Abrams. She's not new anymore. And that lightning in a bottle that I've spoke of here on the podcast and other places is not happening. She at least admits that. And I think that's, you know, it's an interesting self-examination of a candidate who's saying, look, I'm, I'm out here giving basically the same message, but it's not resonating as well. And part of that reason is, is because people know me and it's not new anymore. So, so that is part. But one of the things that I've known about Stacey Abrams is she has been a, a very articulate spokesman for policies, whether I agreed with them or disagreed with them. She's always gave well-reasoned, thought-out answers until recently when it seems like the fight to the left in this governor's race for her to try and beat Brian Kemp has taken her to areas that just frankly, you know, again, is amazing. I mean, she said, she's made comments such as, you know, I don't know when a pregnancy actually begins and dealing with abortion. Uh, I mean, okay. Uh, you know, if you want to just go to the scientific statement of this is when the, the sperm meets the egg. I mean, what else are we talking about here? I mean, you know, that you can't scientifically prove this. Stacey I, Abrams is, is making these comments and, and it's just not uh, playing out uh, in very real terms to others. I mean, again, attacking the ultrasound and the sound that comes from a heartbeat. I mean, again, a lot of, of issues here. And then allowing her campaign, okay, here's where it is, when the truth is simply said, because Georgia has the heartbeat bill, which is a six-week bill, roughly. It's six weeks, most abortions in the state of Georgia are illegal after six weeks. Um, she has an ad running right now with a former prominent district attorney down here that says and ends the ad with, if you want to stop this uh, legislation, if you want to stop uh, this bill, 
then you have to vote uh, to elect Stacey Abrams. Now, in the NPR interview that she did as well, she actually said that she would make Georgia a safe haven, a, a place uh, where abortion rights would be uh, nurtured, if you would, in, in that regard. What I have a problem with is that is that she has no power unto her own to undo the law that has already been passed. Now, she can choose to break, help encourage breaking of that law, such as prosecutors who won't prosecute it, uh, you know, trying to, to get away with funding or do things that, that may uh, change that. But inherently, the governor in the state of Georgia just can't, you know, unless they want to just be completely off the, uh, the grid and say, I don't want to enforce the law. Uh, they can't do that. And it's a lie to the voters. And people see through this when the easiest answer for Stacey Abrams will be to say, look, I don't like this law. I'm going to work with the state legislature, which more than likely will be Republican in the House and the Senate. I'm going to try and work with them to maybe we can come up with a different deal. I'm going to maybe withhold funding. I'm going to work. I'm going to drive a hard budget deal, whatever it is to say, I'm going to do it in this way, not to just simply tell people out there who have not followed civics long enough in their life to realize you can't simply just not uh, to change a law that has been passed and upheld in the court system. That's just one example. Mayor Lightfoot, again, uh, is another example in Chicago. I mean, blaming her crime problem on everything else from guns from Indiana, from, uh, you know, other issues that crime is uh, basically denying that crime is really an issue when the McDonald's chairman uh, said that, hey, you know, people are moving out of Chicago because this, the crime is bad. And Lightfoot saying you need to get educated. Well, they have gotten educated, Mayor Lightfoot. They have determined that Chicago is a very dangerous place, just as Portland and Seattle and LA and San Francisco and New York and Philadelphia, Atlanta, St. Louis, and all these others in which you don't have an emphasis on public safety in a smart way. Instead, you're, you're, taking away police assets, taking away police resources, and you have district attorneys not backing up your police officers, which in turn causes a public safety problem. Or frankly, you're not prosecuting the crimes that you're complaining about. If you have a gun illegal, guess what? The illegal part means it's illegal that you can actually prosecute them. But we're not seeing that happen. So this brings me now to, to Joe Biden. This brings me now to the president himself. When I look back over these first 20 months, nothing, I'm, I'm going to say this into a way that may, it may surprise some of you. It, it's, it's just an honest statement. Nothing legislatively, which has been very little. I mean, there's been four or five big things, the COVID relief package, the infrastructure bill, the Build Back Mansion uh, bill, or what they call as the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which has no hope of uh, reducing inflation. Um, you know, and then they've, you know, passed their CR, they passed their budget. That's about it as far as big plans here. They just, you know, the rest of it is they, they've not done anything on uh, that they said, you know, and passed on guns, a little bit on guns. They did a little bit there, but uh, immigration, other things, just, just not there. They He's run it by executive order, you know, destroying our, our uh, energy independence, other things. But none of that surprised me. What has surprised me, and whether it was Jen Psaki, who was always circling back, it, or whether it's uh, Jean-Pierre, who is just flat out seemingly over her head. I mean, I, and nothing personal, but when you, you don't even answer questions right from reading in a book and you can't come up with answers, and when you do come up with answers, it's not uh, honest it, with the reporters asking it, you're starting to see the problem. Let's go back. And one thing, though, that I have seen this is how they've handled these issues. Why is it so hard, seemingly, for the Biden administration to tell a lie or to tell the truth, instead they choose to tell a lie or, or obfuscate a problem instead of uh, just coming clean when probably coming clean would just be the honest answer. And people probably would respond better to an honest answer. Now, would partisan Republicans respond to it better? No, they're going to use it and you understand that. But at the end of the day, there are, I still believe that there's a large part of the American public that still look for honesty in their uh, in, in honest answers, whether it's a good news or bad news situation, so that they can internally say, okay, here's where I'm at and this is where I need to go. This is something we're not going to deal with today, but this is where journalism is today. This is why people have trouble with journalism because of the inputting of their own political beliefs, own political ideas that are permeating stories every time you turn around here. So as we turn to the to the thing that dis, has surprised me the most about the, the Biden administration, let's just look at a few things. Um, one, it, it's just simple stuff. I mean, and you have the, the president and the vice president double down on it. The first one is immigration. 
uh, in, in immigration, the border is open. Our, our border agents, our border patrol, our ICE agents are demoralized. They're frustrated. I mean, you had a, an incident with, you had our border patrol on horseback. The first thing that it looked like, you know, to, to many was that they were using whips to whip these immigrants and they were not. It was proven. It went through the investigation, even internally. And, and, and no one said, but yet you had the president, the vice president, and others saying that this was terrible. They shouldn't be whipping these people. They should be, you know, repercussions. But yet at the end of the day, nothing was there. Again, no follow up, no immediately say, Hey, I'm not sure what happened here, but let me go check it out. No, it's the, it's the immediate. Uh, cry of the culture to say, I've got to go, you know, put something out and I've got to say how bad this is because immigration is quote, one of their touchstone issues. And they don't want anybody to understand what's going on at the border and that the border is actually open. However, you know, it, it, from a sense of being honest, let's come out to the American people and say, look, we've got a problem on the border. We don't believe that walls, the, the wall that Donald Trump wanted work, but here's what we're doing to reinforce the border. Instead, they have Mayorkas come out, they have the president come out, they have uh, named uh, Kamala Harris as the border czar, who's never been to the border, even going to Texas as late as this past week, and, and not visiting the border. And they're saying everything's okay. You have Democrats in Congress who avoid the question, is the border secure? No, the border is not secure. It is a lie to the American people. And here's the problem. You may not like your answer. You may not like your policies, but people can see it on the left and the right. There's no one that can look on a political ideological spectrum, look at the southern border and say that it's secure. You just can't. So my question is, is when you deal with spin, if you're out there, you know, dealing with issues, if somebody knows that what you're saying is not true, you're probably best not to lie about it. Okay, this just is just be honest here. And that's and that includes Republicans, Democrats, anybody else. We're focused right now, like I said, on the Biden administration because this has been a surprise to me how they've handled these situations. Immigration number one, inflation. When they passed their COVID relief package last year, there were liberal economists, conservative economists, everybody else in between. Number one, not only talking about that there'd be fraud and abuse in this, and there's so much money going out, but they were warned about inflation. And, and, and Larry Summers, others warned them to say, you don't put this much government influence and this much government money into the system in a time, frankly, in which you had supply chain issues, you had a shutdowns that's still in place in many parts of the country, and they did it anyway. Guess what? At the time, the Biden administration was ridiculing all these people saying, you know, this is not going to happen. We've looked at this. This is going to be good for us. And now, you know, less than 12 months in it, they were at 8%. We're at 8% inflation right now, highest in 40 years, people's prices. And then when you couple that along with energy, uh, the attacks on energy independence, you know, we have gas prices at the highest level. And unfortunately for people now, they're forgetting that, that just because that gas prices have come down in many places, maybe a dollar a gallon, they're still a dollar, dollar fifty higher than when Biden took office. What's the Biden response to it? Inflation. This is Putin's problem. This is other things' problem. They again, they will not come to grips with the fact that they uh, have not addressed the issue of supply, demand, and the money in the system. Build Back Mansion or the Inflation Reduction Act. Again, the the biggest lie that continually be perpetrated about this, and you can just this is just uh, things that if you're telling stories about things that can be easily you know, rebuted, and, and I'm talking about things that the press themselves report, but are not following up on, you know, nothing in this bill literally goes after inflation. Even some Democrats, Bernie Sanders actually said, this is not going to reduce inflation. Um, and, and it opened up uh, things that they didn't want to have opened up in there. This is, is a problem. But when they also came back and said, this would cost nothing. That, that, that this plan would cost nothing. Although every, every study is said, yes, it will have a cost to it. And to simply say it would cost you nothing or to imply that it doesn't cost anything simply because it comes from taxpayer dollars is the problem that we have seen in this administration. Again, when you can blatantly see what is happening, but yet telling a different story. Afghanistan, the president said it was an enormous success. On what standard of measurement? I mean, again, this is not a, a meeting held in secret and you're coming out and the president coming out, coming on a meeting that nobody would ever see. This happened in real time in August of last year and we lost 13 uh, Marines over it. And 
hundreds more civilians dead. The Taliban is back under dictatorial control over Afghanistan, terrorizing families. You know, uh, the fa- they're selling daughters in, in marriages. I mean, the, it's just a wreck over there, which was all predicted. But when we immediately began to take out our troops and within no plan of getting them out, the Taliban came in, the Taliban dictated the terms, and yet the president says, oh, it was an overwhelming success. No, it wasn't. But again, the the difference between what is being said and what the actual people saw on their own TV screens was the difference here. And I think that is the thing that is frustrating Democrats who behind the scenes will tell me and tell others that they are frustrated by Joe Biden's numbers. They're frustrated by the lack of support and they're frustrated in how it plays out, such as the Senate race in Georgia in which Raphael Warnock has uh, been an incumbent senator now for over a year and a half and has spent $50, $60 million on positive and negative ads against Herschel Walker and can't break 50% because of his attachment to Joe Biden and this administration. Continuing around on COVID strategy. I mean, I could go down the list. COVID strategy, COVID strategy. You know, we got a COVID strategy. No, you don't. In fact, you were the first vaccine deniers, if you would, when Kamala Harris and Joe Biden said, well, I, would you take the vaccine? Oh, if it's under Donald Trump, I'm not so sure. But yet the minute you get into office, you tell everybody that they got to have it. You mandate it. You, you've wrecked many parts of our military uh, with this policy uh, and caused so much confusion in our, our uh, first responders and folks across the country that it, it is, you know, the damage is, 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 is done. And this is going to be a very difficult people. Again, what did you say? When did you say it? How did you say it? Again, you just can't overrun some of these. But then I want to get to one and an example here. And, and I'm not going to be long today. I just want you to let this sink in. And for, like I said, many people have asked me this question. Why are Democrats struggling uh, when they supposedly got all these legislative deals done? You know, and even, you know, the promise of putting, uh, you know, $10,000 of college debt behind people. And it comes down to not the, you know, the Biden handshakes to nobody, you know, losing his direction on the stage, anything. The concern comes down, again, to being honest with the American people, comes down to an incident from last week. Um, I had the privilege of serving with Jackie Lorsky in the uh, United States Congress. We came in together. She was a uh, freshman representative from Indiana. I was a freshman representative from, from Georgia. Uh, we were in uh, many meetings together. We saw each other often. Um, very uh, kind-hearted, very good legislator. Someone that uh, I, you know, enjoyed being around. Someone that I thought represented her district very well. She represented a, a voice uh, in the Congress that, that stood up for folks. She was very passionate about more women in Congress. She was very passionate about, you know, getting things done. She was very passionate about, you know, veterans. And she was very passionate about veterans' rights. She's very passionate about, uh, you know, dealing with areas of disabled and, and you know, and hunger and, and the things that, that she was passionate about. Unfortunately, Jackie uh, and two of her staff members were killed earlier this year uh, in August uh, in a car accident. Um, for many of us, it was, it came just as a, a very much of a shock and, and one that was very disturbing for, for many, but again, her life and legacy, uh, continue and the things that she had done while she was in Congress are, are still going on. And that includes some issues that the president, uh, chose to take up, uh, last week and some policy issues. And there was a moment in the, uh, speech in which the president by, in which President Biden asked, where's Jackie? Is, uh, is she going to be here? And, and again, very awkward moment, very, uh, you know, a non-understandable moment for many, knowing that Jackie had died. He knew that she was dead, you know, had been told her family was coming to the White House. I mean, this was just something that, you know, it, it was there. Again, though, I, I'm going to, and, and some may get upset with me about this, but I'm going to listen and say, Okay, it happens. Okay, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying that there was a, a, a mental, you know, breakdown there for a second. You know, didn't process it, didn't say something. Joe Biden has had a lot of those because, it, and this makes this even worse. But at a certain point in time, folks, we all screw up. We all have said things that on the surface contradicts the reality that we know. And why you say it, uh, you, you just do. The problem comes and how you address it. Now, of course, the press 
immediately jumped on this. There was a lot of social media activity about this. Here's the interesting part. And again, everything I've talked about about the Biden administration, just, you know, again, telling a, a false narrative when the truth would do probably better has been baffling to many in the Democrat side and also uh, been fodder for those of us on the right. Um, and they would say the same thing about, you know, Republicans and, you know, when they felt President Trump did the same thing. I, I'm just focusing here because we have Democrats who are wondering why they, you know, this, some of them are saying, you know, look, you know, Biden is a liability. It's why we're hearing that, uh, you know, they, there's many who don't want him to run again in 2024. Um, and so we're seeing this as we go forward. The question was presented to uh, the press secretary, Jean-Pierre, about what happened. I want you to listen to this clip. And I'll come back and comment in a second. In the Hunger event today, the president appeared to look around the room uh, for an audience member, a member of Congress who passed away last month. He seemed to indicate she might be in the room. What, so, what happened there? so the president w was, uh, as you all know, you guys were watching uh, today's event, a very important event on uh, food insecurity. The president was naming uh, the congressional champions on this issue and was acknowledging her incredible work. He had uh, he had already uh, planned to welcome the Congresswoman's family uh, to the White House on Friday. There will be a, a bill signing in her honor this coming Friday. Uh, so, of course, she was on his mind. She was of top of mind uh, for the president. He uh, looks very much looks forward to discussing her remarkable legacy of public service with them when he sees her family this coming Friday. Again, listen to what was presented there. They asked, why would he say, where's Jack? when he knew he wasn't going to be there. And she deflected. She just said, well, he's on the top of his mind. I, again, I, th that clip says it better than I can. And it sums up everything that we're, we're talking about uh, today. Everything that we're you know going through in this is to simply say, that's your, I mean, if you want to sum up the Joe Biden first 20 months and why people are, are frustrated, they don't understand and why Democrats, Republicans are furious and why Democrats are, are, are uh, rubbing their hands together saying, why should he run again in 2024 when we're having such a bad time in the 2022 election with candidates not wanting to be seen with him, not wanting to campaign with him or anything else. There's your summation right there. You got a press secretary who had the opportunity to simply say, folks, folks, give him a break. You know, Jackie was a friend. He's been under, he's, he was talking. He, he made a mistake. He just simply made a statement. He didn't, it didn't come out properly. And, and that's it. Move on. Instead, it became not only a story, it became a bigger story and began to question, you know, the president's mental acuity. Sometimes in life, folks, I'm going to change that. All, the truth always at the end of the day is, but will be better fed in the, in the history than just telling something to get somebody off your back or telling a lie or telling a, 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 a or deflecting it or doing anything else. And in these cases I've mentioned to you today, I'm thankful from a political standpoint that they, they chose to, to tell these stories. I'm thankful that they chose not to be honest with American people because I think if they had, Joe Biden's standing would have been better. Stacey Abrams would have been better. Definitely Lori Lightfoot would have been better off in Chicago just telling the truth. But they don't, and that's good. I, I, from a political perspective, that's my political side of the house. I'm a conservative. I'm a Republican. I, 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 if they want to continue to do this, fine. But I don't want to have Democrats continually asking the question, why? Here's why. And so for all of you candidates out there, I don't care if you're, you know, what side of the fence you're on, here's your issue that you need to deal with. If you're confronted with an issue, if you're confronted with a problem, the best way to handle it, especially if it's something that people can see and visually assess for themselves or read for themselves, is to tell the truth. Start off with saying, hey, I messed up, or hey, I believe this. You may not agree with me, but here is why I believe it. This is what's wrong with American politics today. It's what's wrong I see on both conservative and liberal sides. I addressed it from the perspective in this one, in, in the in the highlighted with this incident on Jackie Lorsky and, and the president that I believe sums up where we're at in American politics and American media today. Even the media at the Jackie Lorsky de deflection and basically lie that uh, Jean Pierre said would not let it go. Even, even the media that has been friendly, and you're starting to see this more and more when they talk about gas prices and everything, it will eventually erode the trust that you have. So my advice to people in life, jobs, families, and in politics, especially, especially if it's easily verified, 
or easily shot down, then you need to tell the truth. You need to come clean and deal with it that way and then move on because only delaying it or lying about it will simply deflect the truth and not get you to where you need to go. Folks, election is just a little over a month away, a little under a month away. These are the things that are affecting it. These are the things that are doing it. But maybe we can take a life lesson here. Sometimes, you know, why would you tell a lie when truth is just as good? Well, ask the Biden administration. That's why they're dealing in uh, approval ratings in the high 30s and low 40s, because people are just tired of what they see with their eyes and then what they're being told from the White House. That is the problem that the Democrats are seeing in this election cycle. With that, go to the DougCollinsPodcast.com. You can sign up for our newsletter. we got some special trips coming up. I've been telling you about this. Uh, get ready. Uh, you need to go to the website, sign up on the Collins Collective, get a part of our email list. You don't want to miss what's coming up here on the Doug Collins Podcast and in the future with me uh, as we go forward. So thanks for being here today. We'll talk again soon. Hey everybody, my pillow. I just wanted to let you know, my pillow is having the biggest sheet sale of the year. You'll have to help. Uh, you have all have helped build my pillow into an amazing company that it is today. And now Mike Lindell, the inventor and CEO, wants to give back exclusively to his listeners. Uh, the Percal bed sheet is set is available in a variety of colors and sizes, and they're all on sale. For example, the queen size is regularly priced at eighty nine ninety eight, but it is now only thirty nine ninety eight with our listener promo code. Order now because they, when they're gone, they're gone. You're not going to be able to get it. These Percale sheets are breathable. They have cool, crisp feel. They feel they come with a 10-year warranty, 60-day money-back guarantee. Don't miss out on this incredible offer. There's a limited supply, so be sure to order now. Call 1-800-986-3994. Use the promo code Colin, C-O-L-L-I-N-S, or you can go to MyPillow.com. Click on the radio listener square and use the promo code Colin, C-O-L-L-I-N-S. Lisa and I sleep on these sheets every night. You will want to have them as well. They're a wonderful product. Go right now, either 800-986-3994, code word Collins, or go to MyPillow.com. Also use the code word Collins to get this discount. You will not regret it.